Good afternoon and welcome to the latest in our series of live careers webinars brought to you by the HOP platform. So on your screen at the moment, you can see what that means. That's the Hertfordshire Opportunities Portal, which we have our own website and we have a number of social media handles as well. The purpose of HOP is to inform young people and students in schools and colleges in Hertfordshire about the range of different careers that are available to you um, with information about how you might seek more information about those different careers. The purpose of these, this webinar is to inform you about a very, very specific career. And I'm delighted to say that this week, our focus is going to be on careers in the Royal Navy and Royal Marines. And I'm delighted to welcome to our panel this week, uh, Dex Nath, who is, um, well, let me pass the screen on and you can see his job title. Um, he is the Chief Petty Officer with the Royal Navy, but he's a careers advisor, which means that he is specifically involved in the recruitment of young people to the Naval Services. So, Dex, let me just hand over to you, first of all, and ask you just to introduce yourself and to tell everybody about your own particular journey and to what you do right now. Okay. Um, is that okay? Uh, good afternoon, all. Um, I'm uh, Dex Nath. Um, I joined uh, when I was the Royal Navy when I was 16 um, as a what we call a weapons engineer um, at the time. That was uh, a semi-skilled uh, person. Then uh, got promoted uh, through training with the, within the Royal Navy, uh, and because of the qualities to uh, artificer. Uh, the Navy then trained me for two and a half years to do an HNC in electrical electronic engineering. Um, and then went on to uh, running my own sections um, as doing the maintenance and repair of uh, radar systems, weapon systems, uh, sonar, navigation, all the different communication systems on board. I've also uh, then spent a bit of time in the civilian world as a uh, service engineer in the semiconductor industry traveled around uh, America and Europe and uh, the Middle East, and then uh, moved on to the mobile phone industry as a project manager installing the police uh, telephone network across the UK, and then moved on to uh, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, where I was running a team of engineers around the UK, um, installing robotics machines through to extra uh, vacuum extraction systems, and then uh, rejoined the, the Navy as a careers advisor uh, to hopefully uh, entice you all in uh, to the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines. So that's a little bit about me in a quick snapshot. Thanks very much. Look, we'll, we'll unpack a lot of that and we'll, we'll go into a bit more detail. But really what we want you to get out of this webinar today is to understand about the the, the very wide range of roles that are required within the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines. We're going to think about the skills and qualities and perhaps the qualifications that you might need to go into some of those roles. Um, and that's how you should choose which of the armed forces to join. So we've got, say, Dex from the Royal Navy and Royal Marines today. Some of you might be thinking about careers in the Army. You might be thinking about careers in the RF. Well, Dex isn't an expert on those two particular strands, but he might be able to, yeah, just to entice was the word that he said, or encourage you that if the armed forces is something that you want to go into, to encourage you to really think about the uh, fantastic array of careers that are available specifically within the um, Navy and the Royal Marines. So. Um, um, let me just explain how this webinar is going to work. Um, we will be here probably live for the next what, 30 to 45 minutes, depending really on how many questions you have for us. We'll discuss a range of different topics. And thank you for those of you that, that registered to come in and watch this session live. You did submit a few questions or you, you put in things that you wanted to find out, which hopefully we will cover at the start of this one. Just to reassure you, we can't see or hear any of you that are watching this live at the moment, but you do have the opportunity to interact. So any questions that you would like to ask and this is a really really good opportunity for you to have a direct interaction with Dex today um, then you can do that by submitting it via a text question so on your dashboard you should see that you've got a questions tab so if you click on that and open it out it would bring out a text box and you can type that question into there that will only be visible to me so it won't be visible to anyone else in attendance uh, and then I will direct that question and ask Dex to answer that one to the best of his abilities and knowledge. 
This session is being recorded, so if you can't stay until the end of it, it will be available on our YouTube channel um, via the HOT website, probably from some point tomorrow. And also you'll find on that HOT website uh, all the previous webinars. So this is the 30th that we've recorded of these webinars in the last year, and we, we cover a range of different careers, and we try and cover careers that we know will be relevant for Hertfordshire as well. So, well, Dex, look, first question, can you explain what's the difference between the Navy and the Marines? Because I may well use these um, interchangeably today. Yep, of course. Um, well, the, the simplest way of understanding the difference is the Royal Navy um, are the ones that sit on the ships. Um, we uh, go around the world doing different uh, operational tasks in different areas, uh, such as humanitarian work through to operational theatre, um, fishery protection, oil rig protection, uh, surveying the oceans, um, supporting the British Antarctic Survey. So that's where we would function um, above the water and below the water. So in essence, um, the Naval Service is, is an overarching organisation and then we have different arms within that organisation. So you've got the Royal Navy and then you've got the Submarine Service. So the Submarine Service is under the water, Royal Naval uh, Surface Fleet is above the water and then you, that's supported by the Royal Naval Reserve. Um, and they're, they're uh, then further supported from a logistics point of view from by the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. Um, and then we have our infantry soldiers and they're the Royal Marines. Now they um, are, our, as I say, infantry soldiers. Their main purpose in the environment. So their opportunities is, uh, or training is to uh, be able to work in uh, anything from cart Arctic to um, desert uh, warfare. Um, and with them, they bring the range of skills that they have to have. And they're supported by the Royal Marines Reserves. And when I say the reserves, they are essentially uh, the, uh, people that act in a civilian um, organization. Um, they, they are employed and then they do the Navy and the Marines as a part-time basis. That's how they work as an organization. And then every now and then there is a possibility that they can volunteer or be tasked to support the Navy for up to nine months at any one time. After around about two to three years of training, they become eligible for that. So that's um, the, the main difference. Um, so. Yeah, hopefully can, I've lost video, so I, I can that's, people still hear me. We can see, still hear you. Yeah, I'm sure as you, your Wi-Fi recovers, yeah, your picture will come back in. But we can, we can hear you, and everyone's, everyone's seeing you now as well. So thanks for that okay. explanation. There, you're, 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 you're back again. Um, we've already had a question come through, so I'm definitely going to ask that question. So um, if you say if you do want to submit questions, you put them in the text box, and we will get round to all of those. Um, so the first sort of questions I wanted to ask is just explore a little bit more about who the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines are and the different types of roles that come within them. So could you I mean, just have a go at explaining the different roles that are um, that are required within the Navy and the Marines? OK, so there's over 100 different roles within the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines. Um, the, the, there's two major differences, though, in terms of how they uh, you end up in those different roles. So the Navy side of things, um, you are recruited into the job that you want to apply for. So, for example, if you wanted to join as a medical assistant or a doctor, a uh, biomedical scientist, you would apply for that role. And then you go through the selection process for that role. And then that's the job you join. That's the job you stay in for your career. Whereas um, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, very similar. <clears throat> you apply directly to the Royal Fleet Auxiliary and then you go through their selection process. And that is the job you join and you go on with that. They have their different criteria uh, as how you go about the selection process and the qualifications you need, which I can go into later. Um, and then you've got the Royal Marines. Now the Royal Marines, um, you, every Marine always starts off as a Royal Marine. That's their starting point. They do their 36 weeks basic training. And then um, after a period of time in their uh, commando unit, Now, looking forward, we're going to the future commando. Um, they're going to be changing slightly. 
So um, at the moment, there's 26 different specializations within the Royal Marines. Um, and then uh, you get your specialization. There is the opportunity to move around those specializations um, after a period of uh, and So that, that's a, a certain beauty of the, the Royal Marines is that flexibility to move around up into the rank of corporal. Now, what we're, we're looking to do going forward is the Royal Marines are going to change their stru structure slightly and they're going to be going into smaller teams. And those smaller teams uh, will enable the, the individuals to uh, be, they'll have maybe one or two specializations, but they will add extra specializations as they go through to different tasking. So that if, for instance, if they're doing anti-piracy patrols, um, they would go on a, a boarding course and they'd be taught how to do boarding. But their specialization might be communications, for example. And so they would then do that. But their next job, they would again then get trained for their new specialization. So that it kind of is like a building block as your career goes on. So that's how the Royal Marines are going to uh, evolve over the next uh, three to five years. Does that, okay. uh, does, do you still hear me? Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I've just come up with a slow network connection. <clears throat> okay, yeah, no, your voice okay, and the so audio is coming through. So even if we lose Excuse the picture, me. yeah. We're still hearing you. Um, well, I suppose it's hard to ask. The next question is, what does an average day or week look like? I suppose it depends which role that you're in. But what are the sorts of things that, that everybody across all of those roles would experience on a day-by-day -day basis and a week-by-week -week basis? Okay, so uh, again, uh, that's slightly uh, tainted to a certain extent because we have the rank structure as well. So that, that, that uh, makes it even more diverse as to what you could be doing. So for example, if you're in, in the Royal Navy, um, and uh, the way we work it as well in the Royal Navy is that you would, and this is a general generalization, you would do around about 12 months in a shore establishment, and then you would be on a ship for three years and then you back to shore establishment uh, for 12 to 18 months and then back to sea for three years. That's a general rule, but that's obviously subject to lots of different other things. Um, with regards to that, so when you're shore side, um, it, it could be that you could be doing a, an office desk. So um, if you are like an engineer, for instance, you're on a projects desk, you'd be uh, organizing civilian companies to support the, the military in uh, whatever ship, wherever that is in the world, on a piece of equipment. So you'd act as the interface uh, to uh, answer technical questions through to a range of physics. If you're somebody like uh, a chef or a supply chain, then a chef would be potentially working in a, a kitchen shoreside uh, rather than at sea. So they get to go home every night um, and a supply chain would be working in a warehouse uh, or a storeroom within the dockyard, providing anything from uh, a blanket through to um, a, a complex uh, electrical and mechanical system like a gas turbine, for instance. They would be organizing the logistics of that as well. So that's kind of a day job that you would generally have in civilian world where you go to your office on a day to day basis and then you go home at night time. Whereas if you're at sea, it's very that's where it becomes a little bit more complicated as to how I can answer that one. Um, so when you're traveling from place to place, uh, you would have your daily tasks. Um, so chef, obviously, we need feeding. So we've got to have chefs have got to be cooking and they will continue to cook wherever we are in the world. Um, whereas if it's a, a medical side of things, hopefully from a medical point of view, there's no trouble. That's what they aim for is that nobody's hurt. Um, so they generally would be doing the, uh, making sure records are correct, uh, making sure everybody's vaccinated, looking forward as to um, potentially where we're going to be in the world. Or do we need any protection uh, or any guidance, etc.? They might be doing training courses on a daily basis. Um, when you get to a particular environment, so if we're doing a, like a, a, a take, for example, uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth doing the world tour at this moment in time. Now, that's going to be going to uh, 40 different countries around the world um, and doing around about 67 different visits. Now, every time it goes into a port, it will generally do several things. One, it will try and do some community engagement. 
and that will range from anything to go into a school through to a local charity project and helping out uh, for a period of time that we're there um, uh, through to sporting events um, and that can range from anything from uh, hockey to football rugby um, we even organized uh, water polo matches the last time i was on deployment around the mediterranean uh, so we just went and saw the pti and said um, we'd like to form a water polo team how can you organize and everywhere we went to organize a, a water polo match through to um, the higher kind of level we will represent the country so you you are basically um, representing the country and what we mean by that is we'd be inviting local local uh, VIPs dignitaries local community on board the, the, uh, the vessel um, giving them tours through to wining and dining them through to uh, conferences so we would uh, try and uh, present the UK PLC in its best image uh, and fly the flag essentially as we call it whereas if you're going into something like humanitarian work then we could be uh, doing anything from um, going into a local environment so exact to give you an example again um, the recent uh, well, generally every year there's a hurricane to go through the, the Caribbean so we would uh, as soon as the, the hurricane is finished we would go into that local community as close as we can we transport food goods medical supplies the medical teams would uh, jump on the helicopter um, get transported in to the environment and try start treating those individuals. The engineers would um, get uh, transported in, uh, th hopefully through um, small uh, boats, um, little uh, speedboats, into the local environment with equipment and tools and start helping them rebuild uh, their facilities. Take, for example, water pipes, plumbing, electricity. Um, we start to try and work on the community to try and repair the community and rebuild the, the community uh, in whatever way. Whereas if we were down the Antarctic, we would be um, transporting the uh, scientific team around uh, the, the Antarctic to conduct research in different areas around there. And we would be uh, organising with them where we go, what we do, how long we can be there, etc. Uh, through to surveying the oceans. So you could be a hydrographic meteorological surveyor and you could be uh, going into a local harbour, uh, say, I don't know, Djibouti, and you would be using survey equipment to map that harbour, uh, the new lay of the, uh, the seabed through to if they've built a new pier, et cetera, et cetera. And we would reload those maps back to the UK um, because it's important not only for the, the Navy to understand how they get around the world, but also make sure there's, those hazards um, are made aware of. So that's hopefully kind of gives you a flavour. Um, added into that though, we have a certain, everybody on board ship uh, is, has uh, emergency drills that, that we have to deal with. So whether that be for, for first aid through to fires, because we don't have our own fire service, um, everybody on board ship is, is trained in firefighting through to if uh, we get a hole in the side of the ship, we learn how to what we call deal with the damage control so we stop floods coming in look at how we get rid of the water that's inside the ship uh, and then deal with that uh, the, the repercussions of that of what we do now with regards to the Royal Marines Royal Marines um, again all depends where they are and what they're doing but they generally are, are quite often based um, out of their commando units and they would be exercising uh, on a regular basis whether that be their specialization or whether that be in terms of how they fight uh, uh, as a unit. Uh, they might be preparing to go in and do a certain tasking. So, for instance, um, generally every year there's a, an exercise with the US Marines out in the Mojave Desert. They'd be maybe the month or two before that, they're doing some preparation work. So the, the stores people might be organizing how they get all their equipment there through to um, what the procedures are through getting through um, the Im immigration and passport control, because obviously we can't just turn up where there are weapons, can we, and just expect to be transported through. So that's what they would be organizing, planning the exercise. So the officers would be looking at, right, so this is the exercise we want to, to practice. This is how we're gonna go about it. This is the, the outline criteria structure, et cetera. 
through to if they were on a, a ship doing anti-drugs or anti-piracy patrols, um, they would uh, generally be a smaller team then, and they would they basically split down into uh, several snipers and then uh, a helicopter landing board team. So the snipers would jump in a helicopter. So for instance, if there was a, a we spotted a ship spotted a, um, a speed a boat going across the Gulf of Mexico, they generally do around about 50 knots. Well, our ships can go nowhere near that speed. So a sniper will jump in a helicopter. Uh, he will take a, a 0.5 caliber a rifle with him and he will shoot the engines. So don't go nowhere with the engines. We will then um, at the same time have the uh, Marines, the second party, the boarding party, they will be in the helicopter. They'll drop a rope out of the helicopter, put a pair of leather gloves on, that's all they've got. And they'll slide down that rope onto the boat and arrest the people or inspect, uh, etc. So they would react to the situation. And that's the kind of thing that they could be doing uh, as part of their patrols uh, on board ship through to if they're out and actually on exercise in the Arctic, then they would be training on how to survive in the, in the Arctic, uh, how to ski, because that might be, they might be doing some training courses because we've got, all got to start from somewhere um, and through to um, how you operate in that environment. So it's, it's a lot more difficult for me to explain in detail exactly what you could be doing, but hopefully that gives you a generic flavor of what they can do. Does that hopefully help? Thank you. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a very, very detailed answer there. And I mean, my follow-up questions are going to be what are the most enjoyable aspects of the job and what are the most challenging aspects of the job? But I, I think from what you've just described there and watching this one will perhaps draw their own conclusions to which elements of that they find most, um, they would find most enjoyable or most challenging. There's, there's actually a, a question that's very relevant for me to ask now that's just been submitted, which is how prominent is exercise uh, I'm guessing in terms of your physical condition in day-to-day -day life and, well, I, I suppose if you're hanging out of helicopters with a sniper or sliding down ropes onto decks, you've got to be very physically fit and there's got to be a lot of preparation that goes into that, isn't there? Absolutely. And um, there has to be a, a basic level of fitness for both the, the services, uh, for the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines. Royal Fleet Auxiliary, um, to give you a little bit of uh, context, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary are civilians. So they're civil servants but they're tasked by the Navy. So they have their own criteria, they have their own working organisation. They don't have to do any fitness in essence, okay, apart from being physically fit, because if you're going up and down around a large ship, I don't know whether if anybody's seen them, but you're probably looking at the size of um, eight football pitches and about, uh, say, about eight to ten floors of, of uh, to walk up and down. So add into that a bouncing around, in the water that you've got to be fairly um, fit to go be walking around all that place whereas the the Royal Navy our attitude is you've got to be able to swim that's really really important to us um, because obviously we're surrounded by water at the end of the day and worst case scenario um, if the ship sinks you've got to learn how to get out and how you're going to survive in that water so we expect everybody to pass a basic swimming fitness test. So that entails jumping off a, um, a three meter board, swimming 50 meters in four minutes, treading water for two minutes, and then gets in out of the deep end unaided. Now that's gotta be done when you join up, you do that in overalls. Because all that, because hopefully you understand in the middle of the ocean on a ship, you're in your work clothes, you're not gonna be going popping down to put your, uh, swim uh, clothes on to go out and jump into the sea. Um, we also have uh, some other act uh, activities, uh, fitness levels we expect uh, as a starting point for you when you join the service. Um, one is you have to do a 1.5 mile run and that's age dependent and gender dependent. And then in addition to that, um, you have to pass, uh, when you join up, you have to pass a, um, a what we call a lift carry run so you carry uh, 22 kilos in each hand and then you have to walk 90 meters in 60 seconds and uh, we test your core uh, by uh, press-ups and sit-ups and that's uh, it depends on your uh, gender so that those the reason we have the, the lift what we call the lift carry run is if you, we're fighting fires on board ship um, you have uh, drums of liquid which is used for fighting the fires 
and we have to be able to transport those to the scene of the fire. So that's why we, we're testing your grip strength and your shoulder strength for being able to move them around the ship. So that's the Royal Navy. Royal Marines, um, as a starting point, you've got to be very fit. <laughs> There's no way of getting around this. Um, the, uh, the Royal Marines expectation is a lot higher than theirs because their whole aim in, uh, in life is tasking to be able to move with, under their own uh, power, their legs, uh, with a large amount of equipment, of long distances in very short period of time. So that, that's why they have to, uh, they expect um, to have a, quite a high level, basic level of fitness. So as part of that selection process, they have to do a, a virtual pre joining fitness test where they do um, 20 press-ups, uh, 30 sit-ups, 20 burpees, and one minute plank. And they do that three times through as for Royal Marines. Royal Marine officers um, are higher. They have to do it four times through. But then they do four weeks basic training um, before they carry on with their, prefer their uh, Royal Marine training. Now, that, at the end of that four weeks, they uh, get assessed um, at their level of basic level of fitness. So we, we're using these four weeks to take them from what we class as sub-maximal to maximal training. And to give you an example of what we class as, ma as maximal training, they have to do two 1.5 mile runs, the first mile and a half as a squad in 12 and a half minutes, then they have a one minute rest, and then they have to do a second mile and a half in less than 10 minutes or 10 minutes 30 to be precise. They then have to do a gym test where they do uh, 60 press-ups in two minutes, and that's uh, tricep press-ups um, with the uh, 80 sit-ups in two minutes, and also a minimum, uh, of, well, an eight, a target of 12 overarm pull-ups. Then they have to do uh, a level 11.5 uh, in the bleep test, which is a 20 meter distance. And then they have to uh, do a swimming test where they jump off a three meter board, swim 100 meters, try to walk for two minutes, collect a brick from the bottom of the pool, and then get out of the deep and unaided. Then they finally do a determination test. Determination test, as it says on the tin, really, a bit like Ronsil, okay, is you just keep on going. So you'll do anything from bunny hops to crawls uh, to uh, press-ups, sit-ups, planks, um, and it, all of it is generally outdoors in any weather. So whatever the weather, whatever the conditions, you will be doing the, the determination test because it's all about showing that mindset. That's what the, the basic pre premise of it, all is. And then you do the endurance course, which is a, a two and a half mile assault course with a four mile run back. And you do that in combat sub boots. So hopefully that kind of gives you a flavor of, 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 of uh, the level of fitness, but you, those are, that's the starting point. The expectation obviously is to go further than in, in the Navy and the Royal Marines. Uh, to a lot higher level. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, that is um, a very good answer to that one. Um, the other questions coming. Can you? Are there any height restrictions on joining the Royal Marines? Um, the restrictions for the for the Royal Navy um, is one hundred and fifty one point five centimeters. Now, there are other restrictions, though, uh, or criteria, should I say, not restrictions, um, is things like, and there's numerous uh, that I could go into for, for ages, but some basic ones are um, the, uh, for Royal Marines, you've got to be a minimum of 65 kilos or a BMI of 23.5, um, regardless of gender. Okay. Thank you. Um, can, oh, another question that's coming. Can you join the Marines with glasses and asthma? Are there any medical conditions that would prevent so, you? So uh, with glasses, it, there, are, there are lots of medical conditions that preclude you. If you can look onto the Royal Navy website, there is a, a list of criteria that is an instant bar to entry. Um, and they would range from uh, lots of different things, cardiovascular through to uh, bones, uh, et cetera. And uh, so, Please look at that as your, your, your starting point. But there is a basic criteria in terms of asthma um, that is that I can say is that generally you've got to be four years free from treatment. And what we mean by that is that, uh, that generally you've got to be, uh, my understanding is, I'm not a medical professional, I'll say that from the start, okay? 
So uh, it, it, uh, the basic criteria is um, four years free from treatment. And when we mean by free from treatment is that you're signed off from, by your GP as not being asthmatic. Okay. Um, the, the other question was, um, the second question was height, was it? Sorry. Yeah, question about height specifically in the Royal Marines. Yep. So that was 151.5 centimetres for the Naval Service. And then uh, there was the other medical part of the medical question. I think that was it. There was the one about sorry, the asthma and one about glasses. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, glasses. Um, well, there is a criteria that we go for by glasses. Um, as you can see, I'm wearing them. Um, they, they are allowed in the Royal Marines, um, but we have a criteria on that. Now, my understanding is it, we go by a visual acuity and colour perception for each individual job within the, within the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines, and also the dioptry. And I believe um, it is plus or minus six that you have to be within that range. Okay. But uh, again, those details are fully explained on the Royal, Royal Navy and Royal Marines website. Sure, and we will show you that website uh, before we finish this webinar as well. So we'll make sure that you can access that and you, you know where that information is. Um, there's lots of other really good questions coming through and I, I want to get to those, but I'm just going to go through the sort of the structural ones that I've got set up here. Um, so we're just going to talk about qualifications yep. and the, um, the more actually we'll come on to the recruitment process separately. So just I guess as concisely as you can, are there any subjects at school that somebody should be doing if they want to join the Royal Navy or the Royal Marines? Okay, so again, that comes back to what we were saying earlier. Each individual job is, is unique uh, in terms of its requirements. So, for example, um, and, and I would always recommend looking that as uh, the, uh, the Royal Navy website as your starting point. It gives you every single job. It gives you a breakdown of the educational requirements um, and also the qualifications you go on to gain. So, for example, if you want to go doctor, you've got to get, have a medical degree. OK, so um, we, we do provide support uh, from year three onwards in terms of bursaries. But you as an individual have got to get to the end of year two um, of the, your medical degree before we will support you uh, on obtaining that medical degree. Um, but then that ranges at the, at the other end uh, to having no qualifications. Uh, so you can join as a rating, um, for example, as a chef uh, on an apprenticeship. Uh, the difference is as well, but I need to get across is our apprenticeships are not like civilian apprenticeships. You have a job at the end. That is your job. That is your future. OK, so uh, you will complete your apprenticeship and you will then be uh, automatically. It does. It's seamless. You are in that job regardless. But you can okay. start off as I did. I started off uh, in the old, old days as a, a CSE one in maths. Um, uh, which is uh, probably equivalent to your now fours, uh, and I ended up with now an HNC, electrical electronic engineering, and, and uh, a degree in leadership and management. So it's it is feasible uh, with the service to take you anywhere a range of those. But is it, it is unique to each individual job um, that we you need to look specifically at the required qualifications uh, or even criteria. For example, if you want to join the, as a Royal Navy Police you've got to have a, a civilian UK full driving license before you join. Yeah, yeah, okay. For, I mean, thinking about the skills and qualities, so regardless of whether you're going in as an apprentice chef or whether you're going in as a, yeah. as a, as a junior doctor, are there, is there a set of skills or qualities or perhaps values that all recruits would be judged against that the, the Royal Navy and Marines are looking for? Yeah, absolutely. And so the Navy uh, core, have six core values and that we class that as courage, commitment, discipline, respect for others, integrity and loyalty. Those are what we live by and we ex expect everybody to live by. To give you an example, uh, and, and these are described in a lot more detail, again, on the Royal Navy website, what we mean by each one of those values. So, for example, integrity and loyalty. Uh, loyalty is about the team, loyalty to, to uh, those around you. Um, the, the beauty for me being on board ship is the, is the loyalty, the team ethos that you create. 
So you've got to be able to be a sociable person uh, as, as, a, as a, I would say, a core aspect for an individual joining the service, regardless of the whether it be the Royal Navy, the Royal Marines, or the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. Um, adaptability. So we all don't like going out of our comfort zone, um, but we don't grow as an individual, but also we've got to be prepared to deal with uh, new environments, new ways of working, but also uh, it take uh, humanitarian work. You're going into an unknown environment, you've got to adapt to that environment and to uh, sort of work with that environment. So it's, it's being able to take yourself out of the comfort zone. Organisation is key. So that's a core aspect of uh, I would suggest of everybody, along with the resilience of being able to keep on going in those environments uh, to and a, a big one certainly going forward in my opinion is that ability to uh, and be comfortable to travel the navy is going to be traveling more, more and more with the government directive that we are going to be a global britain my my opinion is uh, and from what i interpret from uh, the guidance of uh, we've received uh, is that the navy going forward is going to be spending a lot more time overseas even more than when I, in my time and and we spent a lot of time away so it, it, you've got to have that resoluteness and that independence to be able to deal with that time away so i'd, I'd say those are the kind of core values that you need to be looking at yeah no, okay um I think that, and those values were it was it was really interesting that you that you quoted them and say we will share the details of the website so you can all have a look at those. But I, I guess those are the sorts of values that you'd be looking to try and identify in a potential recruit through the recruitment process, wouldn't they? Absolutely, and and we're looking for those at the interview stage, but also various other stages. So as part of the selection process, you start off with a psychometric test, um, which is where we assess you you. Um, your ability to deal with the, uh, the professional training for all your job. So that's how we, we do it. So it's slightly different to academics. The academics is uh, uh, um, an attribute uh, for the, uh, the education of, say, specifically for maths, whereas we're looking for the ability to, to do the job itself. And that's why we do what we call a psychometric test. And that's followed by a um, selection interview. So that's where we're looking at you as an individual, as a character, your skills and attributes uh, for the suitability for that job. Then that's, uh, in addition to that, you then have a medical, which is obviously making sure that you're fit for the job, uh, for the Navy and the Royal Marines. Now, the thing that the, a lot of people maybe not don't misunderstand about the service is that if, uh, for example, and this is just an example, uh, for instance, you had an anterior cruciate ligament injury and it's been rebuilt. The, the thing that people uh, believe uh, generally is that I've had an, a reconstruction of told by my, my surgeon that it's perfect and I can do it wherever I like. What the military have to consider though is the environment that you're going to be working in and the impact on others and also we have a duty of care to you to work, make sure that we mitigate that risk. So uh, an ACL, for example, is uh, in most circumstances, it would be fine. But if uh, you're in uh, at sea, um, you are bouncing around, you have lots of uh, fast uh, movement um, or twists and turns. Uh, those put your, especially if you've got weight on, uh, on your back or, or you're carrying it, those put massive strains on, uh, is an example that is on. But you, on that individual person. So if you as an individual suffer injury, not only are you putting yourself obviously at risk, but you're putting those at risk. Because for example, on a ship, a frigate for instance, there's 170 personnel on board. We can't afford to lose lots of people before we start to become ineffective as an organization aboard. So that's what the service is looking at. Not that we don't want you, we would love to have you. But we have to obviously consider all those different aspects to make sure that you are suitable for the job and you, we're putting you in the right place at the right time. Then we have a, a, the different selection process. So there's a fitness test, and then you go on to do a, a potential rule naval course, or a, there are other a, aspects like the officers, 
to do an Avon interview board where we assess your leadership and management. The potential Royal Navy, of course, gives you the opportunity to experience the Royal Navy, um, where you live for three or four days in uh, the military environment. We do some, uh, some uh, physical testing. And then you've got the uh, officer selection course for the Royal Marine officers, where we test you in terms of your physical endurance, but also your, your uh, attitude. Uh, and so we get to see and feel you as an individual. So that there's those, all those little steps um, are assessing you in different angles to get you as an overall picture as, as we can of you, of you as an individual and your suitability, suitability for the job. Yeah. There's a couple of questions that have come in actually about the recruitment process. So let me go through them because they're, they're relevant to pick up now. How long before wanting to start the selection process for the Marines as an officer should you apply? Okay, so um, I keep coming up with this response. Uh, everything's kind of unique in the sense of um, there's only one entry every year for Royal Marine officers, and that's September each year. Now, I, I would generally suggest that you allocate around about eight to ten months uh, a time prior to that uh, before applying. I would in best case circumstances I'd probably suggest that you apply a year before. Now the reason is is because of the number of steps you have to pass um, and also if there's any delays in the process. So for example uh, at medical stage if you we have to write to your GP for further information, that could uh, extend the period of time by a couple of two, three, four months uh, for us to obtain that information. Be satisfied that you're good enough to move forward, et cetera, et cetera. So if you apply that a little bit earlier, then you can build in that time. Uh, and then if it's go all goes well, then you should be able to complete the recruiting process in around about four months. But if it doesn't go well, then obviously gives you that flexibility. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question here. I am not a British citizen, but I'm currently applying for one. Can I apply for an apprenticeship whilst being in the process? Um, if you're a Commonwealth citizen, um, we do uh, accept a Commonwealth citizens. Uh, there are, uh, that has to go through the overseas desk, but um, for the process of joining as a, a UK citizen, British citizen, then you either you have a choice. You can either, if you are a Commonwealth citizen, obviously I don't know where you're from, um, but if you are a Commonwealth citizen, you could apply now while you're going through the process uh, of naturalisation, uh, but you'd go to the overseas desk for evaluation of the current criteria because we have an allocated amount that we can recruit um, by the government uh, and the criteria, uh, etc., that we uh, we're allowed to, and the type of jobs we can recruit into. Whereas, um, if you waited until uh, you became British citizen, then uh, there are generally more jobs available, um, and then you can go through this, the, the selection process with your careers office. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so if the person asked that question, if you do have any follow up, put that into the into the question now and we'll try and respond to that one to you. Um, now, usually when we talk about this section, we talk about any particular degrees or is going to university going to help? And you, you've really answered that by saying it depends entirely on the on the role that you're going into. Um, but a couple of questions have come in around some of the apprenticeship programmes in the Navy. So could you just tell us a little bit about the range of different apprenticeship opportunities that come up and at what level they, they exist at? OK, so there's, um, there's around about 35 different apprenticeships. Um, they generally are for ratings. And uh, so there's a difference between officer and rating. So the officer is looking at the uh, strategic aspect of the ship um, uh, and the wider aspects of, of, of the organization, whereas the rating is more the doer and in a, a, a tighter role specific. So for instance, me as a weapons engineer, uh, I would be responsible for a section, so a range of equipment, and that would be my area of responsibility to make sure that operational. Whereas the officer that was in charge of me, would be um, looking at the different sections on board ships. So they'd be looking at five different sections, for instance, and they would be the overall management. So that's how it kind of works between those. So for the, the apprenticeships themselves, um, they uh, range from 
chefs through to supply chain, which is uh, the organizing of, of, of stock, um, through to what we call air, air engineering technicians, which are looking at aircraft and maintenance and repair of aircraft, uh, medical assistants, um, you get qualifications from that. You go on to like a 30 week course uh, where you get trained in basic medical uh, physiology uh, and anatomy. And then you go on to a, an A&E department for 11, 12 weeks. And then you come back and do a pharmacology course uh, for seven weeks. And then you go back out into the fleet as a uh, qualified. Um, so it's it, each one of those jobs, again, it depends upon uh, what job you're joining uh, and what kind of qualifications you get. So if you're, for example, joining as a chef, then you'd, you'd get a, a, like an MVQ um, at the end of your professional training. Whereas uh, if you joined as a, an air engineer and technician, you would end up with a foundation degree after four to six years. Now, there is some other apprenticeships that are available um, that we, we, we've got the submarine service where we have university graduate uh, award scheme. Now that is a, a quite a unique course. You've got to be doing a BTEC level three in engineering uh, with uh, your GCSEs on top. Uh, and there's a criteria on the website if you have a look at that specifically. Uh, and you basically join and we've sent, put you through a degree course and you will be running uh, in the end a, a, a like a, a nuclear reactor, you'd be uh, part of the, the watchkeeping uh, organization on the nuclear reactor. But that's a very fast degree course. So you, you doing the degree in two and a half years, as well as doing your military training, your submarine training, and your professional training. So we expect expect a lot out of you, but you're starting as a leading hand after 10 weeks. So everybody does their 10 weeks basic training as, it, as what we call the uh, UGAS, University Graduate Award Scheme. And then you go on to do your, uh, you become a leading hand, so which means is you're essentially jumping up two ranks. So we're recognizing your BTEC level three and uh, academically wise and your leadership skills. Because we're looking at somebody as a leading hand, you've got to be able to lead people uh, and have that experience. So but that's what the kind of stuff we're looking for is not only you've got the academic side, but you've got that leadership experience and ability and potential to develop further. Because we're going to be putting you in a situation of obviously a high demand. Uh, we might be paying you more. Starting salary is around about 33,000, but we expect a lot more out of you. Um, and then we have what we call accelerated apprenticeships. They're aimed again at engineering technicians. So we, we have a marine engineer, um, weapons engineer, uh, air engineer and submarines so that uh, again it's recognized it's slightly lower in in terms of the academic side of things uh, we still expect a BTEC level three um, but we expect um, you to uh, still have the leadership and management qualities and then you, you join in as a leading hand and then you join it uh, and going on through your uh, course and after around about four years you get a degree a foundation degree in engineering but again it's still that that ability to be able to adapt to the new environment and then being able to direct um uh, people who've been in service for, for possibly two to four years they're on the same course as you so you so what way it works is if you join as a, like an air engineering technician you kind of this level an accelerated apprentice um is this kind of level but they're on the both of the same course they'll both end up with a foundation degree in engineering after uh, the air engineering technician would take around about four to six years to reach there whereas a accelerated apprentice would take, take two to four years so it's, it's it's saving you that that two years in essence um but obviously yeah more higher expectations yeah no they're clearly very good schemes um the question here how competitive are apprenticeships so are there, are there any particular apprenticeships that you know you're going to be inundated with um applications for i think specifically for you know for school leavers yeah so uh, the, the ones that are competitive is an accelerated apprentice scheme um and the uh, university graduate scheme so they're very competitive um and also the jobs uh the apprenticeships 
ebb and flow as always uh, they, they go up and down the way the Navy works at the moment is generally if you pass the selection process you essentially go into a queue and uh, that queue then is you move forward in that queue as and when we recruit so if we need uh, for instance um, communication and information systems uh, we need uh, 20 the next 20 will be moved to the entry date whatever that entry date is and then, then everybody then shuffles forward uh, to be the to the front of the queue so uh, what could potentially happen is you might have that queue might get longer uh, or shorter uh, so for example at the moment we're very short of chefs so if you wanted to join as a chef now if you could get through the application process by, process by next week you'd be packing your bags next week type of thing um, whereas if uh, to give an example at the moment air engineering technique uh, air crewman um, we're probably looking around about two years as an air crewman uh, in the uh, selection process uh, but who can say in a month's time uh, that might suddenly drop down and that might be due to people deciding to choose something else through to we certainly need 15 air crewmen yeah. Okay. So, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. It's a good answer, and it it, it really sort of brings home um, the the different opportunities that there are, and and the, the effects of supply and demand, I guess, on those as well. Um, just want to move the conversation yeah. on because we're getting to five o'clock. We've had some really brilliant questions that have come in, uh, and I hope we're doing them them justice for you. Um, so I'm just going to ask these questions as they as, as they come in now. I think we've, we've really discussed the prospects for the, for the Navy and Marines. Although let me just head that one off by saying, you've said that you can see that deployment in the future is going to be more around overseas deployment and being away for, for, for longer. Do you, is there still going to be the demand for roles within the, the Royal Navy and the Marines going forward? I mean, we always hear about defence budgets being cut and squeezed. Is that going to have an impact on the number of people that you look to recruit? Um, there's a number of reasons that will affect recruiting, and that will be um, how many people decide to leave job satisfaction, for instance, or retirement through to uh, injuries and medical discharges through to how many people are actually applying to join so that that um, to a certain extent is variable um, but looking forward um, I would say certainly from what we've been informed um, it's going to be buoyant um, we're always going uh, constantly going to be recruiting uh, there's uh, in uh, for the reports of uh, the again the government. I come back to the government's uh, uh, aspirations for the future. The navy have been increased uh, from 33,000 to 33,500, um, and that's uh, our target. Now, the last time we were increased rather than decreased was uh, around about 50 years ago. So uh, hopefully that kind of gives you a flavour of the direction of flow uh, or where the wind is taking us. Um, I would say that we are, as a service, we're in a strong point, in my personal opinion. Uh, looking forward to the future, we've got the Type 1 and 31s uh, coming along, frigates, Type 26 frigates coming along. We've uh, ordered the new Dreadnought class submarines. Um, we've just taken delivery of the um, offshore patrol vessels uh, and inshore patrol vessels. So the number of ships that are coming into the fleet and due to come into the fleet for the future, I would say we are in a pretty good condition. And I think looking forward, those numbers may ebb and flow. And I'd like to think that, well, for example, we recruited 4,800 this year uh, of personnel. Um, I, I would not foresee it dropping significantly in the ne very near future, say the next two or three years. Sure. Okay. And my other question for you is: you, I mean, you're an example of someone who started in the Royal Navy and then you've gone back out into civilian life. But presumably, the skills that you learn in the Navy must set you up really well to go and do a whole range of other um, careers and different roles outside of the Navy. Absolutely, and 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 and, depend, and that uh, again, it is quite unique because um, my colleague he joined as a chef. 
but he went on to uh, be a uh, flight deck operator, so landing helicopters on the flight deck, through to uh, driving a submarine, a coxswain, and being the policeman on, on the submarine, through to being a department coordinator, through run, running 300 personnel. So his range of skills were developed over 20, 30 years uh, to co encompass anything from the, the management side of things, to the administration, to being a chef. Uh, and so he took all those different skill sets out with him to the civilian world. Uh, and that's the other beauty of the service is we try to give you recognition, academic re recognition and industry recognition for those different training courses uh, for the future. Uh, because we appreciate, uh, certainly when I first joined up, um, recognition of courses were very few put and far between in service and so when it did go out into the civilian world it was it did prove quite difficult for us to get that understanding across of the range of skills that you do gain um, uh, within service and that's not just the, the, the uh, hardcore skills but your soft skills as well so we have done a lot better and we have we're in a very good position i would suggest sure okay a um, couple more questions that have come in um, and it's, do you get leave after being deployed? And so that's specifically within the Royal Marines. So do you get leave after being deployed? Um, yeah, yeah, that's, um, the aspiration is to get leave. Uh, that can't be guaranteed. And I'll give you an example. Um, we, uh, a few years ago, um, it, probably five years ago now, uh, HMS Ocean, uh, was on anti-drugs patrols um, with uh, down in the Gulf of Baden for around about six, seven months, I believe, at the time. And on the way back, it was uh, going to be coming home, but it got stopped off and it stayed off the coast of Libya for another three, four months, I believe. Uh, so obviously everybody was hoping or uh, expecting to get to leave when they got home. Um, but they obviously didn't uh, and was out there for another year. The way we tend to try and work it is when a ship is coming away from a long period of time away, and when we class a long period of time, it's six months plus. Okay, so if anything less than that, generally, it's part of normal job aspect. Um, so if you're coming away, if you're coming back, we'll try and fly a certain contingent of the, the ship's company home early, um, and they would have their two weeks leave before the ship arrives back in the UK. And then when the ship arrives back in the UK, then we'd have what we call a main leave party. So about, say, 80% of the ship's company would go on leave uh, for their two weeks leave. And then there would be a, uh, a retard leave that would go two weeks later. So that would be, say, 10% uh, example of, of the ship's company would then go on their leave. If it all works out, I can't yeah. say it will work out. That's, it, it, mm, I, I'm a... I have to be a little bit more cagey about that because I can only say from experience, um, it's an aspiration, not a guarantee. Of course, of course. And so that's why that's why you need um, people in their year back on the shore to be doing all the logistics of all of this because it must be uh, yeah, absolutely um, vital to get that right. Um, other question, will Brexit affect the Navy in any way? Um, that's a diff <laughs> even more difficult question. Uh, I think that's um, it's something for the question for the, uh, the politicians. But uh, from my perspective and my view, uh, I don't believe so. Um, only in the sense of as the aspiration was of the government to be more global. So uh, from us, the impact will be more travel. Uh, I would suggest more uh, relationship building around the world, um, more uh, working with uh, certainly from the point of view that our uh, current way of looking and aspirations, I believe, is to be more out in the Far East, uh, South China Seas. We also have a, a Ford operating base in Bahrain uh, to work in the Middle East. Um, so from the Navy's point of view, we're going to be, the, the focus is probably going to be more away from NATO, um, keeping that as a core aspect and focus, but more uh, looking at uh, where is before NATO's focus, I suppose, more towards um, uh, Russia. We're trying to probably going to be broadening that requirement 
uh, and outlook mm -hmm. so i suppose that would be the the, the, out, the outcome of it yeah okay and then the the, the final question that i've had submitted uh, i want to ask and i'm surprised only one person asked this because i've been thinking this since i knew we were going to have this conversation today do roles such as a chef a medical or mechanic still go into combat yep everybody on board ship is in an operational environment so everybody has a, a task to do and a job to do uh, if you think a, a ship or a, a royal marine um, wherever they go uh, especially ship if they're in that uh, wherever they are they are in an operational environment and everybody has uh, a, an operational task that they have to do uh, at action stations and defense watches um, that's the whole how the whole ship works as a team has to we you utilize everybody and that's why you end up with so many different multiple skills um, uh, so you, you could be uh, for instance as a chef you could be on the damage control team the firefighting team at action stations through to um, a warfare specialist you've been in the operations room uh, assessing the tactical picture using a, a variety of sensors uh, to uh, present that to the command to for them to make informed decisions okay thank you um right well I, th I think we're almost ready to wrap up now so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to share with you on screen now so you've got details of the of the website so that we've referenced earlier and clearly this is going to be a great source of information for um for anything to do with careers within the royal navy um we've also put on screen there some details of some of the social media handles that you might found useful to look at so if you're watching this live i recommend maybe just take a picture of the screen at the moment then you can refer back to those and you can find so there's what instagram there's linkedin there's there's twitter on there as well just as i'm giving people the opportunity to um to take screen grabs of that though dex um work experience now quite clearly if you want work experience um you're not just going to rock up at the um, at the hms queen elizabeth and say can i come on board for a week and find out what this is all about so what experiences can people gain perhaps whilst they're still at school that are going to help them understand what the what the Royal Navy is all around all about. Um, so quite often we have uh, uh, a open days uh, down uh, at Portsmouth and Plymouth. So uh, Navy days, as we call it. So there's the opportunity to go and visit the ships. Uh, there's also um, we try to visit uh, a variety of places around the UK uh, at various times of the year. So um, different naval ships would go into the likes of London or Hull or uh, obviously for, for us it's uh, the closest is going to be London uh, and we open ourselves up that way but in terms of the individual um, sea cadets uh, and Royal Marine cadets would certainly be useful uh, to uh, learn the, the uh, rank structures and uh, marks of respect and uh, in, uh, ways of working of the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines uh, other beautiful organizations uh, as far as i'm concerned and you really helpful organizations uh, certainly to get you those what we were talking about earlier the core skills would be things like the, the scouts uh sea uh, sea scouts getting the teeth in um through to uh the local charity community shops um helping out uh, it may not seem that you are in the right area but it builds that aspect of you of being at the organization the resilience the, the helping of others uh, which is the main desire of the, uh, what we're looking for okay fine and then just on your, as your concluding thoughts and um uh, and points here dex just so i put this screen up here the qr code you can see there if you click on that one that will take you through to our page on the hop website that where you can access all of the previous webinars that we've run so you might find some that are going to be related to this so if for example you're interested in becoming an engineer well we've done a webinar with some with some engineers albeit in a civilian capacity we also did one on joining the police service which might be of interest to you as well so that qr code will take you straight through there and the you can see our hop social media platforms there as well so hop is a home of loads of really, really good careers, information and resources for you specifically with students from schools in Hertfordshire in mind. But Dex, just as a closing thought then, um, if someone's watching this at the moment, what would you say that to encourage them to really consider a career with the Royal Navy and Royal Marine? Well, for me, I would, I would say um, 
the the beauty of the Navy and the Marines is the opportunities available. So you can uh, develop yourself both professionally, um, personally, um, and academically. So what I mean by that is we have uh, regular adventure training. So you can do lots of different experiences. You can travel the world to see lots of different people. I can do um, courses, um, academic courses and professional courses. And so the Navy provides that training for me, um, which is free of charge, which a lot of civilian organizations you have to go and do yourself. Um, but also after around about six years, I get a, a, a six thousand pound pot where I can draw down a thousand pound a year towards educational courses. So again, I can develop myself uh, for in preparation for leaving leaving the service if I want to take a new direction in life, uh, and that's all there. Uh, and so for me, it's the, not only this, the team aspect, the ethos, uh, and the uh, the fun that we have because you're going to have fun about doing your job uh, and the enjoyment and 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 the job variety. Uh, that, that's for me is is where uh, I one of the reasons why I joined. I wanted job variety, I wanted qualifications, and I wanted to travel. And and those are the, uh, what I achieved throughout my career. And uh, if I was exactly the same age again, 16, I'd do exactly the same again, because it's it's taken me from somebody who was very shy uh, and uh, very timid to somebody who's happy uh, to stand up in in front of 500 people and give orders and direction uh, through to being in an environment of, in the middle of the ocean fighting fires. So it, that's uh, what it gives you as a service and uh, that uh, self-reliance and self-assurance, um, I think is uh, second to none. Sure, well, look, that is a wonderful endorsement and a, and a really good point to conclude this webinar this afternoon. So firstly, for those of you that are watching live, uh, thank you so much for registering and taking the time out of your um, day to come in and attend this webinar. And thanks for submitting the questions, which have been fantastic. Um, thank you for any of you that are watching this back as a recorded webinar at the moment. We really hope that you found this useful and you found it really, really informative. But finally, my thanks to, uh, to Dex for giving up your time, not just for this hour, but in preparation for this as well and, and sharing your insights and experience and, and knowledge and we really hope this has been really really informative and we hope it's really inspired a lot of you to consider careers within the Royal Navy and the Royal Marines so thank you for taking part and we look forward to seeing you again thank you very much have a good evening all